Andres will give the talk. OK, so this is one more query complexity talk. And the question that uh, we consider is, let's assume that we have a quantum query algorithm that uses just one query. So how many, well, we know that quantum computers can be much faster than classical. So the question is, how many classical queries do we need to simulate one quantum query? Well, as you know from the previous talk, we can ask this question either for total functions or for partial functions. If we consider total functions, that is computational problems where the correct answer must be defined for any input data, then the previous talk showed that the biggest known gap between randomized and quantum complexity is power 2.5. And yesterday, I described the power four gap between quantum and deterministic. Now, if we go to partial functions, we can define them so that we leave out all the inputs on which quantum algorithm doesn't do well. So we can get really huge gaps between quantum and classical. And this talk is about how huge can they get. Well, first of all, there are some pretty huge gaps that one can find even in the previous research on this topic. So for example, think of the period finding problem. We have a periodic sequence that is accessible through queries. The task is to determine what is the period under a promise that the sequence is indeed periodic. And, and what, what is the period? Well, OK, yes. <laughs> Well, so Peter Shaw showed that we can do it really quickly. And if we make a few assumptions on the period, we can actually do it with one quantum query. So there, here is something for which one quantum query is enough, finding period of a periodic sequence. Now, if we think about classical complexity, uh, well, classical complexity is not n. Classical complexity is less. First of all, Shor's algorithm for period finding only works if you are given a sequence whose length is at least square of the period. Second, if you query t elements of the sequence, you can actually test t squared possible periods. So what happens if, if you have t elements, you can form t squared pairs out of them. And then each of those pairs could, in principle, test one possible period for the sequence. So to put those two together, the period of the sequence can be at most square root of n. And if you have at most square root of n periods, you can test them with force root of n queries. So I think that this is actually optimal. Now, we show that there is an even bigger gap. There is a computational problem, which I'll just describe, which we can do with one query quantumly and square root of n over log n queries classically. And second, we show that this is almost optimal. Any quantum algorithm that makes just one query can be simulated with order square root of n queries probabilistically. So it's optimal up to this log n factor, which is probably artifact of our proof not being quite optimal. OK, so what is this problem? We call it correlation. It's a shortcut for correlation in Fourier basis. So f comes from Fourier. The rest of the word comes from correlation. And here is how we define this problem. We have an input of length 2n, which represents two vectors of length n. And the task is to determine whether the first vector is well correlated with the Fourier transform of the second vector. And by well correlated, I mean that if we assume suitable normalization in which those vectors are of length one, 
Then we have to distinguish between the case when inner product is at least, say, three-fifths, or at most, one over 100. Mm, well, <laughs> yeah, it can be anything, uh, <laughs> anything small enough. <laughs> so, how do we do do it quantumly? Well, actually, the algorithm is quite easy. With one query, we can generate a superposition, a quantum state, which has elements of one of those vectors as amplitudes of the basis states. So what we do is we generate a superposition of those quantum states for both vectors. And then uh, for the second vector, we apply the Fourier transform to it. And then there is this primitive uh, called swap test, which allows to test whether two quantum states are close or orthogonal. So we use swap test to test if these two vectors in the superposition are close to one another or they are nearly orthogonal. So that's the whole algorithm. <coughs> now, the more involved part is the lower bound. So we claim that any classical, meaning randomized algorithm, uses almost square root of n queries. And that is actually quite involved. So we start with defining another problem which we call the real correlation, uh, meaning the real valued correlation. In the real valued correlation, the input are, is two real valued vectors in which each component is a Gaussian random variable. And we have to distinguish between the case when all elements of both vectors are independent Gaussians with identical distribution, and the case when all components of one vector are independent Gaussians, and the other vector is exactly the Fourier transform of the first vector. So the claim is that, first of all, this problem requires almost square root of n queries. And the intuition for that is as follows. Uh, if one vector is Fourier transform of the other vector, then what happens if we take a Fourier transform of a vector consisting of independent Gaussians? Well, if we apply any linear transformation to vector consisting of independent Gaussians, what we get is a vector consisting of independent Gaussians. So, even if one vector is Fourier transform of another, then each vector by itself is just a vector of independent Gaussians. And Fourier transform has an ex this extremely simple property that every entry of Fourier transform is quite small. And this means that every component of one vector of independent Gaussians only has a small co correlation with any component of the other vector. So basically, from this we can deduce that if we query substantially less than square root of n values, then most likely it will look like uncorrelated Gaussians. And we will have no information about these two vectors actually being related in any way. OK, and then we have to go from this real valued problem back to the original correlation. Uh, so what we do is we give a reduction showing that if we could solve the actual correlation, then we can solve the real correlation. And if we have this reduction, we know that we can't solve the real correlation, so we cannot solve the original one as well. And the reduction is very simple. So assume that we have an algorithm for uh, zero for plus minus one valued for relation, and we have an instance of a real for relation. Then we take this instance of the real for relation, and we replace every element of every real valued element of vectors with, with its sign. And for most vectors, if we start with two vectors which are Fourier transform of one another, replacing entries with their signs gives two vectors which are still quite well correlated. So if we can solve plus minus one valued for relation, we can solve real valued one on random inputs, which we can't. <laughs> 
Okay, that's the whole argument. Now I'll switch to another topic. So if you got lost, you can now start listening again. <laughs> <laughs> so our second result is that any one query quantum algorithm can be simulated probabilistically with order square root of n queries. And yes, methods are completely different. So let's say that this is a query algorithm consisting of query transformations and some other transformations in between the queries. So let's think of quantum state at some point of this algorithm. Well, it's a superposition of basis states as any quantum state. And if we have made any queries, then the amplitudes of basis state depend on variables x1 to xn. So amplitudes of basis states are actually functions of x1 to xn. Uh, so the crucial question is how can they depend? And there is an answer to this question which is nearly 20 years old by Bob Beals and a group of other people including Richard Cleave, which says that after k queries, amplitude of any basis state is polynomial in the input variables x1 to xn of degree at most the number of queries. So amplitudes are polynomials. Then at the end of algorithm, we measure the quantum state. Measurement probabilities are squares of amplitudes. So if amplitude is polynomial of degree k, the measurement probability is a polynomial of degree 2k. So in particular, if algorithm makes one query, then the measurement probabilities at the end of algorithm are polynomials of degree at most 2. So now we have this task. We know that probability of algorithm outputting any given answer is a polynomial of degree 2 in x1 to xn. We know that this polynomial is between 0 and 1 because it's a probability of algorithm outputting something. So probabilities must be between 0 and 1. And we want to estimate it with precision epsilon. At this point, this, uh, this is actually no longer a problem about quantum algorithms. It's a problem about polynomials. Let's say that we have a polynomial with these properties. Can we estimate it by querying square root of n variables? And we can. So now, well, what's the most natural thing if we, if we want to estimate a polynomial or, or any, if we want to estimate anything? The most natural thing is that we do random sampling. We estimate some terms in this polynomial. We hope that uh, what we get is a good estimate for the whole polynomial. <coughs> and it works. There is quite a bit of technical pain involving in getting all the details right. And uh, well, it actually took us uh, a couple of months of time to do that. But conceptually, it's very simple. We do random sampling. We estimate this polynomial. It works. Sample once. What? Sample once. How many times do you sample? Uh, well, I sample square root of n variables. I'll, I'll describe that. I have three more slides on this. Well, so here are some of things that we actually have to do. Well, first of all, if we do random sampling, there is one problem into which we can run. A polynomial might have some var variables which have a lot of influence on it. It might have variables who have so big coefficients that make, they can make the polynomial one by themselves. In this case, it's not a good idea not to sample them. So to avoid this problem, we make all variables equally important. If there is an influential variable, we introduce several variables which are all equal to it and which each of them has, is, has less influence. So we make everyone equally influential. OK, so now we have this polynomial of n variables where n is now might be slightly larger than the original n. And we try to estimate it by sampling small number of terms in it and taking some of 
these terms and then rescaling that and using that an, as an estimate for the whole polynomial. The good news is that if we sample, so this polynomial has n variables, so it has n squared terms. Now, if we sample n out of those n squared terms, that's, then this estimator is good enough. So the good news is we can do with much less, uh, with sampling much less terms than the total number. Now, there is a problem. Even if we have n terms, they involve n variables. So we can get by by sampling much less terms, but they could, it could still happen, but they involve all the variables. So sampling, so choosing terms that we include independently one from another is not a good idea. Uh, well, the next most natural idea is this. So let's picture this polynomial as a square table consisting of terms. Each term involves two variables. So terms correspond to uh, squares in this table. One variable is a row, another variable is a column. So what we do is out of n rows in this table, we sample square root of them, n of them. Out of n columns, we, we sample square root of n of them. And square root of n times square root of n is n. So there are n cells at the intersection of these square root of n rows and square root of n columns. And it turns out that sampling n terms of the polynomial in this way is as good as sampling n terms of polynomial independently one from another. So this all works. Module uh, a lot of details, but I'm <laughs> skipping under the rug. And we can actually generalize this to more than one query. If there is a quantum algorithm that uses k queries, we can simulate it probabilistically with a number of queries that is input size to power 1 minus 1 over 2k. And the proof is conceptually still the same. k queries means that we can represent amplitudes by polynomials of degree k, measurement probabilities by polynomials of degree 2k, so now we have to use random sampling to estimate a polynomial of degree 2k. And it still works conceptually in the same way. The question to which we don't know the answer is, is this optimal? We think that it is. And we have a candidate problem for which we think that if it's so, well, for which we know that it's solvable with k queries quantumly, and for which we conjecture that it needs this many queries classically. And so this problem is, co is called k-fold correlation. Um, okay, so what is k-fold correlation? We can view for relation in this way, that we have two black box functions. Uh, and we want to estimate a sum in which terms correspond to pairs of values, one value from one function, another value from, for another function. And these terms come with elements of the Fourier transform as coefficients. So now, instead of two functions here, we can take k functions, take sum of all terms that are products of one value from each function, and interleave this product with elements of Fourier transform. And now the task is to estimate this sum. Uh, so there is a certain upper bound on this sum that comes out of fact that Fourier transform is unitary. So we want to know whether the value of this sum is at least three-fifths of this maximum, or at most one-hundredth one, one of this maximum. So we can do this with k over two quantum queries. Uh, and we conjecture that this requires input size to power one minus one over two k, classically. <coughs> 
Okay, so that's all the results. And now I'll mention three open problems. Uh, well, first of all, this correlation problem, it gives the biggest known gap between quantum and probabilistic computing. And the second thing why I think it's interesting is that there is a statement that quantum Fourier transform is something that is hard to simulate classically. And this, function, this problem kind of provides a precise sense for that. It gives a very simple algorithm that implies that uses just Fourier, Fourier transform just once, and yet uh, doing the same thing classically is, takes a lot of steps. So the question is, can we find an application for, for, a, for a relation problem? Is there some natural computational task that we can solve? either by using correlation or, uh, or by doing something like our algorithm. So the second open problem is, of course, does k-fold correlation require the number of queries that we think it does? Uh, I, 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 both me and Scott, we both find it quite plausible. It does seem to be quite challenging mathematically. Uh, so even correlation proof was a bit challenging, proving that real correlation is difficult. Uh, well, k-fold correlation looks much more difficult. Now, an easier version of the second open problem would be this. Let's think of the biggest quantum versus classical gaps. For one, query, for one quantum query, classically we need almost square root of n queries. If we take problems that are solvable with two quantum queries, the best lower bound on any of them is still of the same order as for one query. If we take problems solvable with three quantum queries, the best lower bound is still the same as for one query. And even if we take problems solvable with log n quantum queries, the best lower bound only increases by a factor of roughly log n. So there seems to be some barrier in the fact that all problems that are solvable with extremely small number of quantum queries seem to require square root of n classical queries, but for no problem can we prove anything better. So the open problem is take anything that requires even order log n or order poly log n quantum queries and prove a lower bound, a classical lower bound that is n to power more than one half. Not even n, just n to power more than one half. Okay, that's all. Just to be really sure, in, when you see in the third open problem, the best lower bound is this and that, you mean the best known lower bound, right? The best known, yes. <laughs> Other questions? Uh, how critical was the uh, Fourier transform to the construction? If you were to use a different kind of a transform, like the Schur transform or something like that, would you see the same separation and complexity? I think it would work with, with pretty much any transformation that has all entries small. Mm -hmm. Well, any, any unitary with, with all entries uh, small. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, I'm, I'm not completely sure, but probably it's not very essential. Other questions? Okay, well, if not, then let's thank Andres again. So we have about a half hour break and then we'll start.